So there are consequences for whatever we put at the top priority, right? We make decisions by what we put as our highest priority. So people need to know what that is so they are aligned. And then they also look to see what could go wrong with that. I prefer that the relationship comes first because I imagine uh, that these two people are in charge now of everyone and everything, and everyone and everything depends on their being happy. They go down, no one's going to be okay. Nothing is going to be okay. Health, finances, kids, nothing. So it, it is how they they shape this. It is how they design this to be. That's exactly what will happen if, if you're not on the same page. Welcome to Men This Way. All right. Welcome to Men This Way. We're off and running. Uh, Tate, as always, welcome to your show as well. We're <laughs> right back at you, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tate, Tate and I uh, were kind of new co-hosts. Uh, the podcast is about four years old, um, but Tate's been joining me this year and I'm still trying to figure out how to do the introduction as a, as a, as a duo, as a duo rather than a solo uh, introducing you to your own show. And which I think is, by the way, is very apropos to what we're discussing today. Yeah, no doubt. With, with uh, our guest, Dr. Stan Tackin. Welcome, Dr. Tackin. Hi, Brian. Hi, Tate. Nice to meet you both. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to have you on our show today. Uh, just to introduce you to our listeners, uh, Dr. Stan Tatkin, uh, some of you have surely heard uh, his name, probably even read his books. He's a prominent clini clinician, author, and developer of, the, of, of what's called PACT, P-A-C-T, the psychobiological, I love that word. That's a rich, potent word. So we're going to dive into that the psychobiological approach to couple therapy. Uh, he integrates neuroscience, attachment theory, and the principles of human arousal to understand how relationships work and how couples can better navigate them. Some of his books include Wired for Love, Wired for Dating, and We Do. I've read uh, two of those. I think I was, already, I was already married and in relationship, Dr. Tackin, when I, when I discovered your work. So... I never read Wired for Dating, um, is the point. You know, is, there, is there really something, such thing as a Wired for Dating? I think that was just the publisher wanted to keep the Wired thing. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I, I know those games. Well, one thing, one thing I want to, just before we dive in, uh, Dr. Sackin, you may not know this, but this is actually your and my, our third encounter. Is really? A, yeah. Oh my God, are you my brother? <laughs> well, that would be our fourth if I was. <laughs> so uh, first encounter, actually, my wife and I, we actually did a couple sessions with you a long time ago, like eight, year, eight years ago or so. We, we, we lived in Calabasas. Don't worry. Did I mess you up? You, you did great. You did great. As a matter great. of fact, they're still married. We're so still look. married. It was, it was actually a, a really pivotal moment for us. It was a really critical moment for us. And, and, and uh, you know, you, you, you said something during that session that just cracked us in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and so that was, that was encounter number one. And if anybody wants to know what Dr. Tackin said, you're going to have to e email me, email me at Brian at men this and I'll tell you, I got a tea, a little tease. And it's you too, Dr. Tackin. If you want to know what it was, you're going to have to email me <laughs> as well. I, I'll do that. And, and he number, knows it. He said it, it's somewhere in the bowels of his existence. So don't and the second, this is interesting. Do you remember last year, uh, Scott Steindorf invited you to be on his a, a documentary movie he's making? Yes, yes. I went out to his place in, in Malibu. Well, I happened to be, they filmed me right after they filmed you. I was oh. sitting on a couch when you were on your way out of that, uh, in that Malibu, was it a hotel or uh, some kind of, not a studio. Building. I don't know what the office building. building. Yeah. yeah. Did so I say I, hello? You did. Cause yeah, we, you know, I called out to you and anyway, so we, we just, you know, brief moment, you, you would have, you were on your way to somewhere else, but that was number two. And here's number three. That has to mean something. Maybe it means we're brothers and we don't know it. That's encounter four. I, I hope know. it wasn't in jail. So anyway, I just think it's fantastic. I'm so glad that's, I'm talking a lot and we're going to transition away from that here shortly, but I just wanted to also, you know, set that up because some of the things that we're going to explore with you today, um, uh, 
you know, without revealing certainly any personal private details of, of, of my wife and, and that session, and everything, but, but, you know, there's some things that happened that were fascinating to me that, that I think what we'll talk about today will also uh, be illustrative. So Tate, take us, take us from here. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Tech, and you have obviously, you, you are an elder, you have pioneered really an approach to couples therapy that, that is clearly uh, transformative. It's deeply impacted Brian and, and Sylvie and, and you, you, your approach integrates the very things that make us human, our, our brains, our bodies, our early experiences. And, and one of the things that really stands out is your, your approach or your belief in the secure functioning relationship. So I, I just wanted to actually start with hearing how you actually define a secure functioning relationship. What, what does that entail? What does that mean? So secure attachment is different from secure functioning. Secure functioning is a way to become securely attached. It's a set of social contracts between two individuals sharing power and authority that is fair, just, and mutually sensitive, collaborative and cooperative. That's really uh, what secure functioning is. Yeah, and, and you, you, you said that in many ways it's, it's foundational to the ways that that couples operate as a team with one another and with each partner having to be fully committed to the other safe, the safety of, and the well being of themselves and their partner. It, it's a two, it's a two person psychological system, like, uh, like, uh, you know, a three legged race, it's teams. Um, and it has to follow the same rules as any team that is uh, sharing power, right? I think that's key, like sharing power. Like even I made this comment in the introduction, like Tate, you and I as co-hosts, like I feel like, by the way, Dr. Tackin, Tate and I have known each other for 40 years. Wow. We're childhood besties since we were 10 years old. We're both 50 now. Very cool. So we have so much safety and trust built up with each other. Yeah. And we're in this new endeavor where I can still feel like we're finding our way. We're, we're you know, we, we don't want to step on each other's toes. We want to be dynamic and all that. And I think, you know, you talk about sharing power. And just keeping that in the intimate relationship space and secure functioning relationships, what is the, what is like, what do you, in your experience, what do you see people bringing into relationship? Like this idea of power, maybe not consciously, but, but sort of just in practice and what needs to, like, how does that shift? Well, couples, yeah, couples are the only union of free and fair, you know, symmetrical, autonomous individuals coming together hopefully based on shared purpose and shared vision, they're the only union that doesn't do that. They don't self-organize. They don't structure. They don't create a hierarchy. They don't shape this invention that is a relationship, which doesn't exist in the real world, right? It's, a, it's, our, it's in our minds. It's an invented mythology that we share, hopefully. You've said you can't take a picture of it. You can't take a picture of it. No, just people. Uh, you don't know if they're in a relationship or not. They could just be gathering, but our but relationship is is uh, is invented by us, and we come to the table with our ideas, fantasies, expectations, and entitlements from our childhood, and so there's a, a built-in difficulty there uh, in this kind of relationship. It's called a primary attachment relationship. And since we're memory animals, everything we do just about is memory driven. We pick each other based on familiarity and recognition. And so we're likely both to have the bite that fits the other person's wound and we'll be proxies. We'll be avatars for all these other people who have in our lives uh, hurt us or made us feel good or whatever. So it's a different set of memory that goes all the way back to infancy, to our first dependency relationship. And that's why it tends to be harder than any other. We don't do that with a business partner necessarily. We do that with a love relationship. And so there's certain things we have to understand about that system or it won't work. Yeah, you, you've actually come up with some really helpful metaphor. You, we've used this, this term of, of attachment and you've come up with these really helpful metaphors that, that, that describe the three attachment styles, anchors, waves, and islands. Can, can you briefly kind of flesh some of that out for us? 
Yeah, we made them uh, sort of a friendly nautical theme because the real research terms are not as uh, friendly. Uh, you know, uh, anxious, avoidant, dismissive, derogating of attachment values is one side. Uh, you know, uh, ambivalent, uh, angry, resistant, clingy is on the other side. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't sound that nice. Um, and so we came up with this to describe fundamentally the secure group, which is basically unencumbered by the fears and the memories of insecure, insecurely attached individuals. So they're freer and they're more resilient and they're not afraid. They're not pushed around by their fears of abandonment, rejection, withdrawal, or being engulfed, um, co-opted, smothered, trapped, right? They're not. And so they're a little bit easier to, to, you know, more flexible and to work with. Whereas insecures are divided largely into two main groups. And we could divide personalities here too. In the distancing group, there's are, there are people who grew up in an environment, a relational environment, where they were expected to be independent before they were ready. And this is a family or a system that's organized culturally. Uh, with the self coming before relationship, performance, appearances, demands, expectations, but also on an attachment level, neglect. Neglect in terms of attachment values. Not as much face-to-face, eye-to-eye, skin-to-skin contact. Not as much interaction and engagement by the parents who are busy, often, and really like their children to be easy, quiet, in their bedroom. They could be building a bomb, but who cares? Um, but but you know, this, sure. in, in largely in the culture of largely in the in the world, um, we have a lot of people in the distancing group. On the other side, we have people in the clinging group. And these are people who um, were uh, basically um, encouraged to depend early and cling early and give up their desire to explore the non caregiver world for clinging to the mother or father, largely because. The mother or father needed that. It helped them regulate emotionally, made them feel better that their child, at least their child, was uh, needy and wanted them and cute and sweet and young. But that also alternated with feeling irritated, frustrated. The child was too um, needy and the parent was too, uh, 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 had a difficult time self-regulating. So alternately uh, had a come here, stay with me, don't leave me. And, um, and and leave me alone, you're bothering me, uh, right? And that created an ambivalent situation, an angry situation where I wouldn't know what I would get. And so I'm always in waiting. I'm always expecting you to drop me, reject me. And that makes me look to you as threatening because I'm defending myself against that. So both the distancing side and the clinging side has certain defenses that we can predict based on the larger group that's from studying babies. We know the trajectory of these infants and children and how they're going to actually um, operate in these kind of relationships. Kind of cool in that way. Yeah, it really is. It was such a big revelation to me a number of years ago because I, I think, you know, I think a lot of our listeners can relate to this as well. I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up in a family, uh, a white middle class suburbs. Uh, sure, parents were divorced early, but you know, and there was alcoholism in my home. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But nobody ever beat me. Nobody ever, nobody ever really screamed at me. I mean, the, you know, the alcoholism screamed at the walls and other places, but it wasn't really directed at me per se, for the most part, you know? And so like, I, I was left alone. I was just like, I was fine. You know, that, that answer, my childhood was fine. I got no problems. I'm good. I got no childhood problems. And to see though, it, it, over these last you know decade or so, to see how the the neglect in a sense, again, mom was there, you know, she was working, but she was there. Dinner was there every night, you know, she was vacuuming and cleaning, doing all the things, making sure that she did everything. So, you know, Dan, that Stan, that's been such a revelation that neglect had impact. Neglect has a bigger impact and it's harder to detect because how do you know something's missing if you've never had it, right? I don't know. Uh, I think this is fine. I think this is fine. And then I come across somebody who did have things that I didn't have and I think they're too needy. What's wrong with you? They respect these things. I never had them. You must, 
uh, you must uh, be special in some way. Uh, and, and so I don't get it because I can't put my finger on things that didn't happen. I can only remember things that did happen, right? And so that's the thing. Mother is there, but she's not there in the sense that she's not available to engage with, right? And that's, the, that, that's what actually shapes the child's uh, uh, adaptation to take care of themselves and to what we call auto-regulate, self-soothe, self-stimulate without the interpersonal stress of the other person, which of course doesn't work out well because parents do demand things from their kids and that's resented in these groups uh, because it feels like they're, uh, it's always for the other person, I'm being co-opted, oh, I'm a tool. Well, I'm not really wanted to be engaged with, I'm wanted be for some other purpose that serves the parent's need only. And so I end up resenting that. Uh, yeah. For you said something earlier about how, oh, how did you say it? Uh, so you, we end up choosing a partner whose bite matches. Yeah. What did, what did you say? The bite that fits the wound. The bite that fits the wound. Oh man. Yeah. I really love that. that that's, I love the wow. visual imagery of that. What, what, what does that look like? Let's say somebody who, who, again, I, I, I experienced, you know, neglect, but there was also a lot of intense emotional energy as well in the home, but still, again, I was just left alone. I'm, nobody beat me, hit me, you know, even really said bad things to me. So I'm fine. What is the, you know, how does that often show up? Just coming from my perspective here for a moment for, for listeners that may identify with that. How, how might that show up in, in a relationship in terms of a relationship that is not secure functioning, right? How might somebody bring that? Because there's a lot of anger that can also still show up with that. Yeah, anger usually comes from a sense of unfairness or injustice, right? Unless your life is threatened right. uh, in some way or you're feeling helpless, that'll bring about aggression. Most anger is about uh, a sense of injustice that shouldn't have happened. You owe me, the world owes me something. Right. And so I hold on to those relationships I deem unfair, which doesn't allow me to grieve the fact that I lost something. I, I didn't have it. Uh, anger binds me to the object, binds me to that system so that I can't really grow up. I can't get over it because I'm still stomping my feet. It shouldn't have happened. Say it ain't so. I won't accept it. And that keeps me stuck. Right. That kind of anger. Yeah. Um, but also anger about uh, currently um, having my autonomy taken from me, uh, my stuff. You're going to rob me of my uh, independence. And that's a very real thing to somebody who's always had that experience. And the interesting thing about insecures is that they, they perpetuate the same system unwittingly because their defenses always appear as unfriendly or threatening to the other person. And so, uh, so they tend to make each other worse instead of better because they're simply human beings, right? They're not paid to deal with their, uh, their uh, partner's deep issues of attachment, right? They're going to react appropriately. And so that's why it continues. And it takes, that's why secure functioning, it takes a set of social contracts, agreements based on what must happen between you and I that protects us from each other, that allows the system to be, to get rid of threats and to be safe and secure, which allows development to go forward, right? That's the, that's the idea. Um, but insecure is, um, uh, the very thing that, where I'm vulnerable, you tend to poke at. Uh, the very thing uh, you're vulnerable about, I tend to poke at. And we, and we battle on those grounds. We don't understand that the other person, uh, you know, needs to be handled differently, right? Um, again, we're not paid for that job. We're just reacting as human beings will. So that's what I mean, the bite that fits the, the other person um, maybe doesn't have the capability that I'm looking for. And once again, in my family of origin where I'm not being cared for the way I want, or I'm dealing with an angry person. I never really able, was able to regulate that state with my angry father or mother, and I picked you. And here again, I don't know how to deal with you, right? And I don't like anybody that I don't know how to handle. That's uh, true of all humans, 
We don't like that which we can't handle. And that's what ends up happening. I don't like you because I still don't know how to handle the animal I chose. Right? I'm incompetent to do it. And of course, I think it's you. Lover, of course. That's the human condition. I'm unhappy and I don't know why. Oh, yeah, it's Tate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's and so, <laughs> yes. yeah. so there are all sorts of reasons why our relationships aren't going to work. Most of them have to do with the lack of agreement structure, you know, a co creation of something that is uniquely ours. And the other is not understanding how warlike we are and how easy it is to, th to be threatened and how acute our survival instinct is always. And go to war like that. One of the things I'm just so, I guess, impacted around this map of attachment is, is one is it gives a worldview into, into us as individuals in ways that one can be very helpful from an awareness standpoint. And, and yet there is the, the question beyond that, which is what, what do you see as the, the purpose of this map from an attachment standpoint? Is it that, that people should be figuring out where they are and how to move towards being securely attached? And if that's the case, how do they do that? Or if, is it rather to really just understand the attachment style that you have and learning not how to change how you are, but how to, how to, dance within that attachment style given who you your partner who you and your partner are so think of attachment as a memory of what happens when i depend on someone i need to depend on someone but then i go uh oh how do i do that without getting trapped or without getting left um i remember what that's like and now i start to protect myself in a very particular way so it makes all people are a pain in the ass all people are difficult irritating annoying and disappointing no exception but this adds an extra layer of difficulty if i'm not aware of my of what i'm afraid of and i'm not taking responsibility for what i do that's only pro self and not pro relationship right it's good for me but if it's not good for you too bad and that's where we get into trouble. So if I'm an avoidant, I mean, really avoidant, I'm going to do what I do and I'm not interested in knowing who I am or why I do what I do. I'm going to focus on you being the problem. And so I won't take responsibility for my anti-relationship behavior, right? Um, and that's the problem. So you want to be with someone who, who has some experience, has failed in relationships and suffered enough to be interested in why they do what they do so that I can come to the table and I know I'm avoidant. I don't want to be, I choose not to be. And so, um, so I'm going to fight my own avoidance and we're going to put things in place that keeps me from doing things that will hurt the you. Right. That's great. That's fine. But the person who isn't aware and doesn't care is probably not going to uh, satisfy anybody if they need or want something more than that, right? So that's the problem there. Otherwise, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. Compared to just the problem of being a human primate, which is already a big problem, just an ex extra layer of predictive behavior. You, you advanced this idea. And I think I've maybe even heard this first when, when my wife and I did our session with you seven or eight years ago that I really resisted. And yet I think it's foundational for a couple to shift out of the, 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 you know, two independent, one system operating one person systems into a, 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 a we, a two person system. And, and this was the idea that the, the world is dangerous. The world out there is dangerous. And you are in each other's care. Now, again, speaking as our, our, our resident uh, avoidant, or what are we, island? Our resident island-ish, ish. I'm a recovering <laughs> avoidant. Are you? Okay, okay. I'm recovering That, may, that makes like three that. of us. <laughs> so I, re I, I just like did not want to buy into that. The world is dangerous. Also, like I'm a white guy. I'm a white guy in America. The world is made for me here. So I don't, I don't think I've been attuned as much. And I, you know, just again, childhood, all that. It's like, ah, the world's fine. It's a friendly place. Cops are friendly. You know, 
yeah, you can't trust other men, but they're fine. They're not going to do anything to you. Can't what, trust what, other men, specifically other men. That's specifically, yeah, you can't trust them, but they're fine. You know, just keep an eye on them and keep. Anyway, and this, but this idea, this notion, you are in each other's care. That's that was hard for me to really embrace. Well, that, that's team. That's team thinking, right? You and I have a mission. We, we're, we're bonded together by a purpose. We want to stay alive, let's say. Um, right. That flattens our differences. And therefore, I have to, you have to be in my care because if you go down, I'm screwed. If you freak out and I don't know how to handle you, I don't have a wingman. I don't have somebody who's going to be next to me, help me survive. So it's, it is, it, it, it's a must, right? It's a must. I have to be interested in you because I may have to pick you up when you fall apart. You have to do that with me. Otherwise, we're unprotected. So we have a purpose that uh, changes the game. We both want to win, let's say. Well, that flattens differences too. We're both a pain in the ass. But remember, we want to win. and We have a vision. We're going to win. And so that forces us to collaborate and cooperate with each other as long as we have a shared purpose and vision. Once we don't, watch out, which is why there's a problem when a country, uh, 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 a community, a couple, a business lose their shared purpose and vision, people fragment, there's civil war, and people start finding what's uh, different and what's uh, not alike about each other. And that's the human condition. We're all like that. Mm -hmm. And, and you really speak to, uh, you know, one of the things that's occurring for me is that you hear countless stories of the couples that stay together until their kids go off to college or until they graduate college. And that that shared mission of raising our kids ultimately isn't sufficient for the couple. So I, I just wonder, you know, what, what are the types of shared visions that, that you see couples come to that is empowering above and beyond a, a, a age and stage that a couple is getting through? Well, first of all, um, uh, again, this is a design problem. Um, I would say most every problem in marriages or relationships is a design problem. These are the inventors, the creators. They're the gods. They're the architects of this thing that nobody knows anything about except them. It's supposed to be bespoke. It's supposed to be shaped by their desire, mutual desire. And if they don't agree, it's no deal. Right. And so if they're not doing anything, it's war. It's the Wild West. It's anything goes. And that's just the way we all are. We have to plan for our devil because we're um, unreliable, aggressive, uh, uh, selfish, self centered, moody, fickle, uh, racist uh, species. Always were, always will be, unless we put things in place that, that keeps us in line. Right. No exception. Same with partners. So um, uh, uh, they have to organize. And if we're organized where the kids come first, well, uh, the couple is dead. Long live the kids. They go away and bye. Um, because we lost that loving feeling. We never nurtured it. We, we weren't important enough to maintain. And so there are consequences for whatever we put at the top priority, right? We make decisions by what we put as our highest priority. So people need to know what that is so they are aligned. And then they also look to see what could go wrong with that. I prefer that the relationship comes first because I imagine uh, that these two people are in charge now of everyone and everything and everyone and everything depends on their being happy. They go down, no one's going to be okay. Nothing is going to be okay. Health, finances, kids, nothing. So, um, so it, it is how they, they shape this. It is how they design this to be. That's exactly what will happen if, if you're not on the same page. You know, you're, well, I was in the military for 10 years and I remember during training, I mean, talk about having a mission and a vision and a purpose and also a boss, you know, an authority sort of holding it all together. And I remember in the military, like I, I got so good at taking care of my people. Yes. I was an officer in training. I actually, one of my uh, uh, colonels in my training said to me that I was this close to getting one of the top award medals for, for training, for performance. But he said, the reason I'm not giving you the medal is because you took, you 
these weren't his exact words, but essentially he told me, you took too good of care of your people. Not enough mm-hmm. mission focus, too much, too, too much care of, of your people. So it's like, interesting. Now I get into intimate relationship. I don't want to take care of this person at all. I don't like, sh- she's on her own. I'm on my own. Kind of harkens back to the, look, nobody took care of me. Why the hell don't expect me to take care of you? Maybe so you're still angry that you didn't get a medal. Um, <laughs> I am. Are, that's not, that's not <laughs> untrue. Um, it's not uh, untrue. <laughs> it's not like that. It's like I had to take care of my mother and my father. Hell, if I'm going to take care of anyone uh-huh. again. Yeah. But the actual is I'd like them to take care of me, yeah. Um, mm, yeah. which is very fair. So yeah. and the two aren't the same. You're in an, you're in an asymmetrical system like, like childhood. There is a boss you have to you have a superior that you have to heal to. That's part of the system. Whereas in a couple system, there is nobody, unless you decide there to be, there is nobody. These are two generals, right? Which is a different situation, right? Nobody, you don't get to tell me what to do unless I agree ahead of time and give you permission to tell me what to do and vice versa. That will work, right? That will work, but it's reciprocal. Um, whereas it's not in the military. And the other thing that's great about the military is that the first thing you learn, especially in special forces, is that you don't matter. The person to your left and right matter more because they're going to save your life and you're going to save theirs. And so there is, it, it, it breeds an interdependency thinking that we have the same thing to gain, the same thing to lose. We're a team. And if we're not uh, working together, we're putting lives at risk. And so uh, it's forced. You have to think that way. Couples don't. Yeah. I, 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 one, of the, one of the practical ways that I think that this comes to a head, you've, you've talked a lot about this. This is perhaps the, the part of your work that really hits me between the eyes the most is, is this notion that, that we as couples have a responsibility to help regulate the nervous systems of our partners. Tell us, you know, expand on that a little bit more. Tell us, tell us what that means and why that's important. And also how a person can navigate whether or not they should be taking care of their own nervous system and to what extent they should be really leaning in to help regulate the nervous system of, of their partners. This has been thought through. Um, in, in the area of psychobiology and neurobiology is that the way we operate is that um, it's how our, our brain operates and, and how, the, how data flows, that I can see what's going on in you in, at close distance before you know. Uh, you can see what's going on in me before I know it. So it makes more sense for us to regulate each other, which we call co-regulation, and that's what happens in infancy and childhood as adults, then it is for me to simply rely on my own self-regulation. It's too slow. And it also doesn't work interpersonally because while I'm doing that, I'm appearing threatening to my partner. So think of this. Uh, you're, on a, you're on a tight wire with your partner and you're balancing, right? And you have to look at each other because if the other partner starts to get wobbly, you have to adjust. Otherwise, it's, otherwise you both go down. So that's, that's this. Interactive regulation is a, a, a moment by moment shifting and changing of regulation to accommodate what you see happening in the other person so they can stay safe and secure, so they can stay in their right mind. Uh, otherwise, once they get their heart rate gets too high, blood pressure too high or too low, you lose that person as someone you can influence. You can't, right? They're not available anymore. There's a brain change, a, neuro, a neurological brain change that is a fact. And it takes very little threat for that brain to change. Therefore, it's incumbent upon me to watch you as I talk because everything I do is having an impact on you. If I don't care that, about that impact, good luck. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to get anything because I've lost track of my audience. So, so this is, uh, we're keeping each other balanced so we can get something accomplished without getting into a war. We're trying to make a decision without fighting. We're trying to make, um, a a repair 
without uh, lingering resentment and unfairness. We're trying to decide, or we're trying to solve a problem without solving each other. And that's a discipline of collaboration. That's a discipline of knowing that if I don't take care of you at the same time I'm taking care of myself, you will see me as a threat. And we won't get anything accomplished. Uh, this is, um, I think this is, this is, I think we're getting some really good meat of, of our exploration. Uh, one thing I recall, Dr. Tackin, is when my wife and I were in our, probably even our first session with you, I think we were telling you about an argument that we were, had been having and your eyes, you were darting back and forth watching each of us. I've never seen anything like it. It was like, wow, this is fascinating. And I knew a bit about your work. I already knew that what you were focusing on was what's happening in the body. What were you looking for? And, and maybe not even just specific, obviously you don't even remember the session. I, so I'm not asking for the specifics, but like what, what, sh what are you, what were you looking for? What, what, what should we be looking for? Like, what are you tuning into when you're, when we're talking about nervous system and regulation, be like paying attention to what's happening in the moment? Well, in my research, uh, it, it was studying uh, couples um, over and over again uh, using digital frame analysis, frame by frame, going slow motion and forward, so slow motion backward, double speed forward, uh, mm -hmm. to try to catch um, these somatic cues, shifts and changes that foretell what the other person is going to do and also gives them away in terms of what they're really experiencing. So narratives lie, that includes me. And so uh, narratives aren't reliable. So I'm trying to catch people in the act of being themselves under stress. So I'm looking at the person who's not using resources. That is the person who's not talking. So as soon as you talk, I look at Tate. And I'm looking at Tate to get a reaction, to look and see how he's reacting to you. And then I go back and forth. As soon as you stop talking, I, my eyes go to you because your face is going to show something when you release those resources that are being taken up with talk. And that will show me uh, something different. So I'm looking in spaces to find people. Um, and, I, and these are really lightning fast reactions. So we have to train our eyes to see these things. Um, otherwise, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be locked into the words. Um, where we talk, and that makes us difficult to study and to help. Animals, babies don't. They're easier. Um, we mislead each other uh, with our talk, and that can be a problem. So I'm really looking at these two people uh, like animals. Um, they're saying words, but their sounds uh, could be barking. Uh, and I'd still understand what they're doing by the tone of the barking, the pressure, the speed of it, by how their faces are what happens with their bodies right after they say something or a partner says something. That's more fascinating um, to watch, to see, uh, because we're not aware of what we're doing at any given time. Uh, real time's too fast. It's faster than our consciousness, faster than thought. So we're mostly acting, behaving reflexively and automatically according to memory. And when we're asked in the moment why we're doing something, we make it up. We have a very big part of our brain that makes shit up constantly. That's not evil. That's just, that's, that's everybody. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. who we are. Yeah. In, in our, in our work with men, that's one of the first distinctions. The first practices we ever do is helping separate story from phenomenon in the body, feelings, sensations, uh, um, things that can be located in a sense in the body. And, and it's interesting, Tate, did you hear what he said? Uh, narrative, narr narrative, narrative lies. How is that in Narratives are, are, are inaccurate because I'm always talking from my own personal narrative, which is intended to protect my interests only. So my report is always going to cherry pick and is going to be filtered through my history, my memory system, and how I'm feeling in the moment, which means it is only so accurate. Um, uh, yeah. For many reasons, because I'm always tilted towards uh, towards how I'm perceiving things from my current state of mind, and my current state of mind is informed by my memory. Well, I think well, I think you know that you said it so succinctly. Narratives lie, stories lie. We we will we'll remind guys. We the way we use the language is we get lost in the story, but I think that's such a even simpler way of saying it. Story lies. So we'll we'll be quoting you on that. 
Yeah. And it's, again, this is not intentional. It's automatic. It always, will. I, I will do it. Everyone will do it. And remember, we're constantly afraid of losing anything. And so my narrative will also be sculpted according to my, my trying to avoid any loss as a result. And so that's another factor, another force that's changing what I say. Also, memory sucks, right? I can't really remember much of anything. Um, the way I record experience is faulty to begin with. My memory is always embellished by my feeling at the moment. So how accurate could it be? Um, and so we're dealing on a slippery ground, right? Our perception is always shaped by our state of mind. What I see, hear, and feel, and smell is actually altered by my current state. Uh, uh, our communication sucks, always has been, always will. We think we're understanding, we're not. We think we're being clear, we're not. It's really amazing. I mean, amazing. Uh, we're mostly misunderstanding each other, and that's a fact. We just don't realize it. Um, we argue about memory when neither of us can be right. Yeah. And this is, this is the human condition, full stop, everywhere, no matter who you are. This is us. Well, I, one of the things I'm just always profoundly humbled by is, is having the opportunity to work with men that are really trying to figure out the ways in which they can improve their, not only their relationship, but the skills that they're bringing into relationship. And as you, you talk and you share, I'm just, I'm, I'm very present to the reality that the vast majority of us people, not just men, but men and women do not have elders in front of them showing them what it's like to really navigate uh, masterfully inside a relationship to models, models. yeah to, to be the models right and so in lieu of having not having models what we do is we we make up what it means to be in a successful relationship and we we may experiment or we we try to read a book or and 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 all of that leads us to usually greater and greater levels of frustration because we don't know how to practically do things that will make our skills, our relationship, our nervous system better. And I and I go back to, you know, I think many of us experience trauma as a part of our life. To to live a life is and and there's various levels of that that people go through, right? But the ner I'm going back to this nervous system regulation because the pain of the past is informing the pain that somebody is experiencing in the moment. Can you give us some real practice? You know, since we didn't have models to show us how to regulate the nervous systems of our partners, it or even what to look for, even or even what to look for. Can you can you give us some practical thoughts about what? What skills, what tools, what practices we can be leaning into to help us mutually care for, develop the teamwork of relationship that's necessary for success to happen? Well, a couple of things. One is to understand uh, the tricks of the brain, brain hacks, knowing how to override our most common uh, errors uh, that have to do with miscommunication. It has to do with uh, appearing threatening. Um, that has to do with not falling on our own swords and making amends and repairing uh, perceived injuries immediately without delay. These are all things we have to do in order to avoid uh, a snowballing effect of threat memory, which ends up being biological and is very difficult to undo. So we have to know the nature of ourselves and, and not be naive to it. Um, so I actually see it differently. We actually don't, for the most part, part, make up our own relationship. We actually do what we know, what we saw, what we heard, because it's simpler, easier than it is to actually co-create something entirely new based on who we are today. I don't know anyone who does that naturally, um, and yet it must be done. Otherwise, I'm, I am uh, I'm doing as I've always done, uh, which is nature repeating itself which it tends to do, I'd, I'd have to consciously from scratch build something that I believe would be wonderful that fits me today and you fits you today. And we'd have to agree that would be building something from the ground up. The people aren't doing that. And that's the problem. 
So that's that I just wanted to make clear. It's, it's the opposite of that. Uh, uh, but um, for instance, if you and I are under stress and we want to get through it alive, and we want to get through it as quickly as possible, we both have to understand that we have to be orderly, number one, because as soon as we talk about something stressful, our resources go down. Therefore, we don't have a lot of resources left. What do you mean by that, resources? Blood, oxygen, glucose. Got it, yeah. Physiolo um, physiological, biological resources to... to that to, the brain, that the brain yeah. requires in order yeah. to error correct. Totally. So we have error correcting uh, executives that are, uh, that are resource demanding. They take up a lot of oxygen which won't be available if our heart rate goes up to a certain level, our blood pressure goes up to a certain level, or if we begin to feel uh, um, stressed to the point where, uh, where we begin to express corticosteroids in the brain, not blood. That has a dampening effect on the executive. So I am not available to think. I'm not available to do anything but to be reflexive, automatic. And I'm using pattern recognition it looks like you're threatening, I shoot it. That's how the, that's not personal. All of us will do this. You get me excited enough, threatened enough, I am no longer your friend. You are no longer a friend. You are a threat. You are the enemy. You're an adversary. I no longer care about your position. I'm only going to care about mine because my survival, this is fairly dumb, but then are these fast acting dumb features can't, can't afford to be smart if I'm about to get hurt. I have to act. I have to act now. So the problem is that we can be wonderful when we're okay. But as soon as we get stressed and become automatic, we're not. <laughs> we're not easy and we're not friendly. And this is the problem. So how do we trick that system? One is to talk only about one topic at a time, never two, never, ever, ever more than two, which is hard because we have an associative mind and I'm going to go off into branching. I'm going to chain link. Yeah. And that reminds me of this, right? But I can't do that under these conditions because it's like Jenga will just fall apart. I have to look in your eyes because I have to track you in real time to see, you know, literally moment by moment, how I'm affecting you. Because if you start to go and look like you're not okay, nothing's going to happen. I have to stop the presses and take care of you right now. Make sure you are back to feeling safe because I cannot influence you if you have those corticosteroids in your brain. I cannot. It won't happen. There's no way I can do it. Therefore, it's incumbent upon me to return you that way because I want to get out of here and both of us feel like we got something done, right? So I'm, I'm going to keep it short. I can't hold the stage long because that will make your blood pressure go up. So I have to be as direct and take the shortest distance in my words. I can't talk too much. I can't say a lot. That's an aggravant under stress. So I get right to the point and I, and I hand it over to you and we go back and forth. But we both have the idea of scurrying to mutual relief as fast as we can. That's the goal. That's the goal. I can't go into the past because we'll fight about memory. I can't use you as an example because now I'm working on you and that's war. There's nobody who will stand for that. Right? As soon as you think Tate's working on you, Tate better get ready because you're going to, you're going to protect yourself. And you're going to fire, you're going to fire back as one wolf. I'll show him it's him that has to be worked on. This everybody on the planet, folks. <laughs> this is not pathology any more than any more than most of the shit we do. Uh, that's terrible as human beings is in pathology, right? We otherize anyone different than me. I like to eliminate, or at least not live near, right? And how often is that happening? Every time I have somebody who I can't handle or isn't like me. So. We're a complicated species, and all you have to do is look at history and look around you. It's always happening. So partners need to have ways to absolutely protect each other from each other. There's no, oh, she'd never do that. That's naive. Of course she could. Of course I could. 
We can do all of those things if the conditions are right. What we want is to make it impossible virtually to do any of those things, even if we feel like it, because we are co-constructing principles that are higher than us that we believe is the best thing or the right thing we could do, even when we don't, even when it could be the hardest thing to do. Only that protects us. Only that has ever protected us. And most couples never think they should have to do that. My wife and I, we've been together coming up on, let's see, nine years. And I remember, I, I think I told her this not long ago, maybe a couple, it, it took me about seven years, Dr. Tacken, to really trust in the relationship, to like relax and do being able to trust, not trust her so much, but trust in the relationship. Seven years. And that's two people trying. That's two people like leaning in, doing the work, uh, going to therapy, do it, just all the things. I'm curious, and maybe this is an unanswerable question to some degree, but but most people, to you, you, you just the point you just made, they enter a relationship and think, oh, we should just get each other right away. It couldn't be farther from the truth, right? <laughs> because we're familiar, we think we know each other, right. and then we get lulled into thinking we know each other, and uh -huh. then we automate each other, and that's when the real fun starts. Because <laughs> now. Now I'm not formal anymore. I just uh -huh. walk into the room and talk to you. I don't say, do you have a moment? Uh, right. I call you from the other room. I do all <laughs> sorts of things because we, I think we're family mm -hmm. and we're not. Right. Um, and, and also I think I know you and I do not at all. I know you enough to be dangerous. Um, but that's the automated mind that always has to free up novelty to make more room for new novelty. So we automate everything. That makes life easy. But it also makes us stupid. We don't, we are no longer paying attention. We're no longer there. We don't think we have to be. That's a problem. That, and we have to know that is natural. And there's only one way to combat that is to build in moments of presence and attention. It's the only, it's the only antidote. It's like, it's like, it's like you got to learn how to be good with each other in a way, right? Like that, and that, that's not something that, that, I mean, that takes, I guess this is the unanswerable, or maybe, I don't know. I'm just curious to hear what you say about it. But I, I think it took my wife and I six, seven years, and we're still working at it. It's not like we've arrived anywhere, but we're to get really good at being with each other. And boy, we've come a long way. And that's us trying to do the work and figure that out. What would you, you know, what would you say? Like, how long does it take in your experience? I, I, I get, I don't know if this is answerable, but for people to get really good at being with each other. Um, again, it depends on if they don't co-construct a structure with a hierarchy and a centralized purpose, a reason for being like who or what do we serve? Why do we exist as a couple? And it's got to be solid. It's got to be solid. It's got to be for all time. Um, if we don't, then we're going to fight. And I don't care how good you are. You're not going to be that good because as soon as load bearing takes place, you're going to go live and you're going to do the same things I talked about. You're going to be animals. So. Um, so I can't emphasize enough, organize, organize, structure, always build this thing. Um, take what doesn't work and build something uh, going forward that, that, that blocks that thing from happening again. If for either of us to do that thing, that is no bueno, right? That's smart, right? Um, to always be shaping this according to our delight so that we define what is being good to each other. It has to be defined. Right. I may think being good is different than what you think is being good. So we have to really talk about that because otherwise we'll hurt each other. This is this is not a luxury. We have to do this or we get what we pay for. Now, there are naturals who are really good at this. I've seen many natural. My wife and I are naturals, but naturals will fall apart if the load bearing is too great because they don't have any skills or any plans or any preparation for big storms. So either way, you got to do it. You got to, you got to plan as if, as if you're capable of doing the worst possible things and do not, and do not think love will wheel out because it does yeah. not prevent people from doing bad things. Feelings actually can lead people to doing bad things. Purpose keeps us from doing it. We do this. We decided this is how we're going to do things, even though it will be the hardest thing to do because we want we want something better. We want something good. That takes, 
That takes raising the bar, dreaming high, thinking big, and, and making sure we're absolutely on board and that we both drank the Kool-Aid. I want this principle for myself. I believe in it. I will do it. If you're not here, I will do it. If you're not doing it, I will do it. Even when I hate you, I'll do it when I'm mad at you. In all cases, it will be done. And if we agreed, you'll do it too. Because we've given each other permission uh, to boss each other around, to, to be the executives, legislators and executives. We've given each other permission to enforce this principle um, um, uh, and the other person must cooperate or they're out. You can forget a principle, but if you betray that principle when reminded, you're no longer safe. You can no longer be fit to be a team member because you won't be governed. That's the rule. And that's true in everything. Rock and roll bands, dance troops, Olympic uh, teams, military, cop car partners, you name it. That is a fact. Well, it's, it's it really reminds me when, when when we're working with guys in our relationship work. It's one of the one of the things that we really challenge them to do is is to is to figure out what is your relationship vision. Why are you together? What's the purpose? Where are you going? Is vision? Yeah. Well, Where are we going? Yeah. Where do we want to be five years from now? You know, we're world travelers. We decide that's that is a principle that defines us. We're, we are world travelers. Um. And so one of us only needs to remind each other, hey, it's time to go uh, and visit the world somewhere. And so we do it, right? But we have a vision. We're going there. I, I, have, I, I have one more kind of practical. I know we're rounding the corner for, with our time together. I, we really appreciate this conversation. It's just found in a, in a thousand ways. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we face with the men that we, we work with is, is there is this threshold moment that they are finding themselves in and they something has happened they they've found themselves to literally the end of their relationship or or potentially nearing it or it has just happened and and from a practical standpoint how does a couple know when they should double down and dig in to keep working on on the business of their relationship on on the safety of their relationship and, and when and how to discern when it's time to let that relationship go? Okay, that's a great question. First of all, the only time if you're organized and you guys are doing this correctly, the only reason you would leave the relationship is there's been a change and one person no longer believes in one of the principles that are essential to the other to be happy, right? Now you want to be polyamorous. You have a right. I want to stay monogamous. I have a right, but that's going to be a problem because we won't be able to get along because we're pointing in two different directions. Now, this is not about what color we paint the wall. This is about happiness. This is about values. This is about how I want to live. That is true incompatibility. So when we talk about incompatibility, it's not whether you like tennis and I, and I don't. It is whether on the big ticket items that, re, that are required to be absolutely safe and secure at all times and to be happy, to be happy in this, because uh, it's designed for that, right? It's designed for happiness. Not, not that I, I can't be depressed in myself, but, I, but it isn't the relationship that's making me unhappy, right? So, so in order for it to be durable, we have to come together and make sure that we agree on the big ticket items, safety and security first, because if that's not there, we can't do business at all, right? Trust isn't there. We can't do business at all. The, the factory shuts down. We stop making widgets. We can't because we, we don't trust each other. So we can't work, right? So that first, and it has to be maintained rigorously by both of us because the world will never do that. Remember, these are social contracts that you and I are engaged in that the world does not give a shit about. The world will not do this with us. It'll do it on a big level, but we're individuals. Therefore, we can get screwed. You and I are not going to screw each other because it will be mutually assured destruction if we did. Because you and I are saying, let's do this, not that. Let's create an environment where we can be ourselves and relax. We, we're as free as we possibly can without violating each other's rights or sensibilities. That's the only limit. And we're dedicated 
to each other's happiness, safety, and security, right? I am responsible for your ongoing safety and security. You're not, I am. And I, you're responsible for mine. That works. And we do it by agreement. It's a social contract that nobody else will ever have with us, but we have it because we can make that. And the alternative is bad, right? All you have to do is look at the reality of it. And so that forces us to do this and to play well together. Otherwise, we both suffer, right? Uh, and so if I hurt you, you're going to hurt me back. If, if you lose in any gamut, I'm going to pay for it. There's no way I won't. So therefore, this two-person system of two independent people that are bound together by, by, uh, by their fate, right? Their fates are tied. They have to work and think in a different way. I have to consider you at all times as I consider myself. I can't, I can't allow for this to be a solo sport because that, that courts trouble. It's a team sport with practice, discipline, belief in that we will do it. So, so I have no reason to leave you because this is the best deal in town. You start to feel depressed. I'm going to take care of it. You're feeling unsafe. I'm going to take care of it. You feel something's unfair. I'm going to take care of it. Stat. That's good. We're going to stick together because we make it good for each other. We don't just assume it will be. We, it's assured by agreement. Therefore, why would I want to leave? Oh, I'm out because my mind is playing tricks on me. Suddenly I reach midlife and I think, oh, is this all there is? And gee, you're not as hot as I thought you were. And you're gauging. Oh, I'm not that into you. Um, I want something else. Uh, that's my own mind messing with me. I have to know the difference between my need to get away from where I've chosen to be um, as opposed to understanding that I'm always going to want to get away at times from anything I commit to. I choose my career at times. I want to get away from it. I choose my partner at times. I don't, I, I'm disappointed, uh, right? But that's, my, that's me. That's in my head. And part of the reason I choose and, and commit is to learn about myself and another person. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because I love them at every moment or I'll be attracted at every moment. Or I'll be right. That's not going to happen. I'm not doing it for that. So, and, and hopefully you're not too. So we have a different, higher level reason for commitment. I'm choosing it. You didn't choose it. I'm not here because I have to be. I elect it, and I know yeah. when I choose it, I'm going to lose things. Yeah, that's right. There's a sacrifice to be made. A sacrifice because I can't. I any decision involves loss. I can't. I can't choose anything without eliminating other possibilities. And so, but then I'll never, I'll never know anything if I don't. I'll never be good at anything if I don't. I'll never understand myself fully because part of understanding myself is all the ways my mind wanders. And my, I want to get out. I want to go to this. I want to go to this. All the ways that I would dilute what I'm after. Make sense? So, it, so secure functioning, folks, is growing up. I, I, I'm, I'm, as we're talking, Dr. Tackin, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Again, I've been following your work for, for many, many, many years. And what I'm, what I'm just so struck by, and it's, it's, I know for, look, our, our audience is largely men. We have a lot of women that listen to this show as well. So, but you know, we're men, we tend to talk about things from a male perspective, whatever the hell that means. But you know, that's the, the focus of our show essentially. and and our work. And one of the things that I'm aware of is that for a lot of men, relationship is just daunting. It's daunting. You know, and a lot of men lose hope in a, in a, in a way on, along the way. Remember, there is nothing more difficult on the planet than another person. <laughs> yeah. You're in a yeah. monastery. You're really good at, yeah. at yeah. that uh, aesthetic life. You are really good at all of that. And then you get together with another person and everything falls apart. Yeah, it's daunting. And, and what I'm, what I'm again, just so present to, and I've, I mean, I've, I've been doing myself this work, both in, in my own relationship with my wife and, and girlfriends prior and, and, and as a, a professional coach myself and writing about it and all this, I, I, I am aware also that it, it's hopeful, you know, it, it, it's it, it, like, there's something here for us to engage with that, that really unleashes one of the things that men will, all, all, will often say in women too is like, I want a partner who has my back. Like I'm confident they got my back. 
And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, the pathway to creating a partnership where each of you really feel like the other has your back. Yes. And if, if I fail you, I'm prepared to fall on my sword and say, that was wrong. That was terrible. I'm in the wrong. I'm so sorry. I want to make it up to you. That's terrible. Right? I do not argue that. I do not challenge your perception that I didn't have your back. I take care of it like that yeah. because the relationship is more important yeah. than being right. And it's again daunting, but yet yet hopeful and inspiring yeah. and and a, a, a worthy challenge. And it's hard. And it's yeah. hard. <laughs> and but, so, but it's worth it. Though. But it's but it's worth it. And it's worth it. And and so. I mean, I know we could just geek out with you for hours. We could, there's just so, we're just tip of the iceberg here, uh, but we want to bring this home and, and please, I think you're working on a new book. Is that right? Well, I just finished one. I finished the update, uh, the second edition for Wired for Love because it needed updating from 2012. And I just, I finished, I came out with In Each Other's Care, which is a more advanced book on social contract theory and also everything I talked about in terms of structure. In each other's care. That's very much the thing that I said earlier. I was like really resistant to because <laughs> nobody, I didn't really feel cared for in an, certainly not an emotional sense. Except nothing less. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So where can people learn more about you, find your books? Um, go to the PACT, P -A -C -T Institute .com, the PACT Institute .com, And there we have, we train, started off as training. I'm, I'm a professor primarily. Um, uh, we do trainings for mental health professionals throughout the world. It's very complex theory, though. It's polytheoretical. And we do a couple retreats every year. Um, this next year in January, Costa Rica. It's a five-star, five-day retreat. Come. Uh, and then we do a couple workshops online, my wife and I. Uh, we see those, and there's one starting very soon. So people and can, can find, find all, that, all that at thepactinstitute.com. Great. All that will be in the show notes as well. You can just open the show notes and click on the link. Uh, Dr. Tackin, thank you again so much. I look thank forward you. to our fourth encounter. I don't know when and where it'll be. <laughs> or fifth. Or fifth. I, I really enjoyed this and I really am envious because it's been a long time since I've been a part of a men's um, and and um, I'm thinking of the same thing. Yeah, I kind of miss that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, anyway, and you guys seem like great. Thank so. you. Thank you. Super grateful for your time. What a Thank what a profound thing. And and let me just let me just maybe end with this. Thank you for being a man in the world that is a stand for the, maybe the most important pact that we can make as human beings, which is to do life together and figure out how to how to navigate and to heal and to grow and to make an impact in the world because of partnership. Thank you for being the kind of man that's a stand for that in the world. Thank you. Well, you know, the teacher needs to uh, teach us what they need to know. That's right. Yeah. 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 Know that one. Indeed. We know that one, <laughs> All right. Thank you.